<laughs> so can I firstly welcome you to, to Mills and Reeve. It's really our pleasure to be hosting this event this evening. Thanks to Chaplaincy Plus for giving me the opportunity to speak on a subject that is really, really close to my heart, that of diversity. And to do so during Black History Month is really doubly special for me. So my topic is, as you've heard, is increasing diversity in the workplace, the business or moral imperative. And this will see me share some of my own journey here at Mills and Reeve and some of our lessons along the way. So I'm gonna start by just thinking about why is diversity important to me as a Christian? So being black and female, how diverse my space is and how inclusive is the environment are questions that I'm always assessing without even thinking about it. You know, as I walk into a room, I'm already subconsciously thinking, is there going to be another black person in the room or how many women are going to be present at this event in this room? And so these are visible traits that we wear every day of our lives. Someone with a disability may walk into the same room, but their quick subconscious questions will be different. They may be thinking, can I see the presentation? Can I hear what's being said? Is there an adjustable desk for me to use? What are the access uh, like to a particular venue? They'd probably have Google that venue beforehand to go, is this wheelchair accessible? So we're all subconsciously and very quickly, without even thinking about it, thinking, you know, what, how inclusive is this environment or this place that I'm going to be walking into? We are getting to that point where we can bring our whole selves to work, where we don't have to suppress our true self or try to fit in, or even worse, try to, or just make do. And that journey that we're on collectively is really what stirs me up in this area. So I will talk mostly about the work environment, but let me stress that the need for greater diversity and inclusion and just general acceptance applies as much in our churches as it applies in our workspaces. And some of, would have heard me tell this story before. I, I was born here, grew up in Jamaica, returned here in 1991 with my family. And one of the earliest and most overt acts of racism that, that I experienced was in church, believe it or not. It was um, during the service and it's the time to shake the person's hand, you know, to show the, the sign of peace. And I extended my hand very innocently, very newly returned to the country to the person sitting next to me who looked me from head to toe, turned her back and refused to shake my hand. And I thought to myself, maybe I imagined that. So I went back the following Sunday and I sat next to her again. And she did exactly the same thing the following, but with that intensity in her, in her face that said, did you not get the message last Sunday when you sat next to me? So I'm saying that there is no space that is immune from, um, lessons around diversity and inclusion. The command given to us in John 15, 12 is to love one another, even as God has loved us. In Ephesians 2, 10, we are told, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. And I just want to focus on that word masterpiece for a moment. A work of outstanding artistry, skill or workmanship. Why should diversity be important to every business in Birmingham? Because 
regardless of whatever protected characteristic we hold, we are individually and collectively masterpieces. If we are permitted to bring that to an organization at whatever level, there can only be one conclusion. That organization will benefit from our different gifts. Businesses do themselves no service by only looking in the mirror. And by that, I mean by simply replicating themselves. So there is a, a lot of data out there, and I promise this is not going to be death by PowerPoint. I probably only have about four or five PowerPoints, mm -hmm. but I wanted just for you to understand a little bit about the data today. So, here are some figures from a very recently published study. So this study was published only last month by the Black Equity Organization. And I mean, it, it's set out there, I'm not going to read everything, but you can see the results, some of the headlines. 65% of Black people said that they had been discriminated against by healthcare professionals because of their ethnicity. Over 60% felt that they had been passed over for promotion or employment due to their ethnicity. The age old statistics of, of stop and search, 59% said they or someone close to them had experienced stop and search. And 50% of parents with children under 18 said their children do not see themselves represented in either the teaching workforce or curriculum materials used. I came across this report only yesterday. I think it was published perhaps just a couple of days ago. And it's a report by Robert Walters group. It's a, a recruitment group. And they too had some really interesting statistics. 58% of Indian professionals felt that they have not been offered a promotion during their time at their current company. 24% of Asian and black female professionals saw lack of diversity in senior positions as a challenge to progression. So that bar is, is there. 20% of professionals from a mixed ethnic background did not feel like their manager took time to understand their personal circumstances. And when it comes to ethnicity paid data, 19% of UK based employers have reported their ethnicity paid data. So this, so this company surveyed just over 6,000 professionals to help them to create um, their report. And it's a report that is very comprehensive. I've only been able really just to pull the, the headlines for you, but I would really commend it to you as a report worth looking into. So really, this is not a glowing picture nationally and Birmingham is no exception. So let me start unpacking a little bit more about um, this subject and, and make it relatable to our journey here at Mills and Reeve. And I also want to say immediately that it doesn't have to be a doom and gloom story. I'm hoping that we can leave here today taking some positives. So our journey as a firm was fairly typical of many businesses in Birmingham because we spent a lot of time talking to colleagues in other law firms, but in other sectors as well. So the, the stats were fairly typical, both of Birmingham and indeed nationally. As a firm, we have always prided ourselves on wanting to do right by our staff. But some, in about 2019, there was more of, of a burning imperative on two fronts. One was to increase the number of female partners that we had here. And the second 
was to increase the number of staff from a black and brown heritage. So a lot of my examples will probably relate to making businesses more ethnically diverse, but really this talk is not exclusively about ethnic diversity, and I will try and, and discuss the other characteristics as well. So that was the start of our journey here at Mills and Reef, and we set up focus groups. And then we had working groups. We prepared reports to our board. At the time, um, our board had recently appointed a female managing partner who was really energized in this area and, and set the agenda for us. And that was the start of our diversity and inclusion plan. So when I'm, I'm just gonna say that when I had to stand as the only Afro-Caribbean female partner before a room of well over a hundred partners, I'm gonna say maybe 99% were white. The basis on which we put the case for diversity was the yeah. business case. It seemed the most obvious hook at the time because clients were challenging the diversity of the teams doing the work for them. We were starting to get pushback. Your teams need to be more diverse. Public sector tenders we're asking for diversity statistics and diverse teams. So there was a bit of our culture is important. We've always prided ourselves. You know, we've made what was then the Sunday Times top 100 places to work for consecutive years more than, than any other law firm. But in trying to get the other 100 plus partners in the room to kind of listen, we said, really, there is a business case for this. I'll, I'll come back to, to how we now look at, you know, the need for diversity. So we introduced lots of changes. We recruited our first head of diversity to lead the strategy. And that, that was huge. That, that made a lot of noise in the, the city. It signaled internally to the firm that we were entering a new phase in our thinking and approach, but it also signaled to our competitors in, in Birmingham that we were now just taking diversity and inclusion to another level. And with the full backing of the board, we developed our initial strategy. We set up new networks and we strengthened others. So we set up our REACH network, as you've heard about, that's our race, ethnicity, and cultural heritage network. We had Spectrum, which was our LGBT plus Q network, but that was re-energized. We set up what we call our ability network, which was to support those with disabilities. And we were in the throes of figuring out all of this around diversity and inclusion when COVID hit. And, and we had to think about things differently. So we now talk about diversity, inclusion, and well-being because the focus then was really about well-being. We then set up a parent and carers network because we, we found out that we were excluding individuals in our workforce because they were either they either had parenting responsibilities or they were carers. And it's a simple thing like, when were we holding? What time of the day were we holding social events? Was it after work? Well, if you're a carer or a parent, chances are you're going to be excluded from that event. So we had, and more recently, we have set out what we call our balance network, which is our gender network. It's not about promoting the interest of women, but it's just looking at gender balance. To give an example, I would love to see more of our male members of staff take paternity leave. You know, why is that not happening? What, what is the um, perception or the misperception or the stigma? So we're just so out through our balanced network, we're hoping to tackle some of those, those causes. 
we embarked on an educational program. We started to include new language to the firm, and this coincided with the George Floyd clinic killing. We explained why certain comments do not land well. I don't see color. Not, not, not a good phrase. Not everything is about color. Equally, not a good phrase. Yes, but all lives matter. Equally, not a good phrase. And our REACH network produced our white privilege video, which I want to share. It wasn't a fancy video. We didn't get any experts in. We just use our phone and compile the video. So bear with me. I... Okay. I can rent or buy a house without having to consider how others in the neighborhood will think of me because of my color. I can go shopping alone and know that I will not be followed or harassed by a store manager or security guard because of the color of my skin. When I was at school, the curriculum materials used included people of my race. I do not have to educate my children to be aware of systemic racism for their own daily physical protection. I am never asked to speak for all the people of my racial group. When I ask to talk to the person in charge, there is a good chance that you will be facing a person of my race. In day-to-day -day life, I can easily buy media, such as greeting cards and toys, or go to a museum or art gallery and see people of my race represented. I can be sure that the color of my skin will not impact standard of medical care in the city. I do not have to think about the way I am perceived when dressed casually by those in financial or business settings because of the color of my skin. I can attend events in a professional capacity and not be in the minority or have to think about how I may be perceived due to my race. So that was okay with me. So that was a video that the Reach Network prepared and shared internally. I hope you'll agree that it was a, a powerful three minutes. And so we started to think about what businesses can do, what businesses such as ourselves can do. And I offer a, a menu of options. Uh, 
I wanted to get off the video. Okay, so let's do that. But firstly, we need as, as organizations, as individuals to start thinking about how we change the culture where we work. So we did things like, you know, we developed a, a clear strategy. We had, we looked at our recruitment policies. Training, there was a lot of time that was put into training. We worked with allies. I'll pick up some of these in greater detail. We had champions for some networks. We looked at mentoring, work allocation, education, we looked at how we used social media. We looked at our own website and had a, uh, you know, we, we literally had our, our website redone. And we looked at what we were doing with our part-time workers, including part-time partners. And we did some work around our adjustment survey. So I can't look at all of these in detail, but I just want to pick up a few. Unconscious bias training. I know the jury is out. I have heard all the arguments against unconscious bias training, but I really think there is merit in using it if it is used well. We use it just before any major recruitment or internal promotion exercise. So what we don't do is say everybody in the firm must have unconscious bias training. You tick that box, you move on to the next thing. But what we say is before we do a recruitment for trainee solicitors, everybody who is involved in that exercise, whether it's reviewing the application to interviewing, to assessing um, uh, the, train, the applicants on the day must undergo unconscious bias training. When we're going to do our round of internal promotions, we say every senior manager must undergo unconscious bias training. And I'm not here talking about, you know, we must have shared values, of course we must. But we need to be aware of things such as affinity bias, gender bias, perception bias, name bias, to give a few examples of things that unconsciously creep into our minds and our behaviors when we are about to recruit. And unless somebody says, hold on a minute, do you realize what you just did? You just came out of an interview and went, Ah, that was a great interview. We spent the whole time talking about, you know, golf because we have so much in common or, or our horses because we have a shared love of horses. And then you start to think, but what about the other candidates? What did they bring to the table? Did you even listen to what they could have offered the firm? Or was this um, affinity bias to somebody because you had a shared hobby with that individual. It's so easy to do if somebody doesn't name it and call it out. We put a lot of um, store on the support we get from our allies. We could not be where we are today. We could not make the progress that we have made without our allies. They have been powerful voices as they have come alongside us. They have been empathetic. They have been our voices. They have educated themselves independently. They have challenged others as appropriate and they have been visible. So the next I want to talk about is mentoring. Most people know mentoring works. It's great, absolutely. I could stay here and talk to you all about our mentoring programs, but I want to talk about the reverse mentoring that we used. So we had junior members of our different networks met, reverse mentor our board members. So our managing partner was mentored 
by a very junior Asian lawyer. And that really helped to change her thinking and just give her an exposure that she wouldn't ordinarily have. So there's really good examples of reverse mentoring out there. I've spoken about our networks. I'm not gonna say much more than yes, huge believer in the power of networks. It's a safe space for, for staff and allies to discuss what's going on, set the agenda and escalate it up into so it falls into the strategy. Recruitment of policies and practices, of course, like everybody else, we looked at that. One good example, we use an organization called Rare Recruitment to help us. We were like, why aren't we getting um, shortlisting from certain ethnicities? So we had to do a deep dive. Who, which organization is out there helping in this area? We landed on rare recruitment. And what they do for us is they go through the applications and they don't, nobody gets preferential treatment, but they will star certain applications that would otherwise have not met our criteria. And it's just a do pause and look at this particular application. There is something different, or this person may have extenuating circumstances. There may be the sole carer of a parent, or they may have a disability, or they may have an unusual education pathway. It doesn't say that person gets through, but it just tells us to just stop, pause, and look again. Because when you, you know, you get over a thousand applications for I don't know, six vacation schemes, you're going through them with the best will in the world. You're thinking, does this person meet all our, our criteria? It's a bit like UPIS points. So RARES just slows us down a little bit. And we've also trialed removing university names from the applications prior to the interview stage. So if you're conducting an interview, you don't know whether the person in front of you is from um, a Russell Group University. So you've got to take that person as they come to you. So we've taken away that bias from the application um, process. And, and one last thing um, is on work allocation. We now have a work allocation manager, and that's just to ensure that how work is allocated in teams is more transparent and fair. So it's not just, you know, new instruction comes in, you know, big piece of work, the partner has the person who he or she's always dealing with, or the person who sits closest, or again, unconsciously biased towards a couple people in the teams, they become favorites. So we've tried to remove all that from the process. So new instructions will go into the work allocation manager who will have a word with the partner and go, what do you need in terms of skills to manage this piece of work? And then we'll go away to say, who's got the skills, who's got the time? How do we, how do we create a team to do this piece of work? It's a great way to ensure not only that we get good candidates in, but that we retain them. We don't frustrate them because they're not getting the good quality work. I've probably gone for it. I think I'm running over a little bit, Steve. Okay. <laughs> okay. And our adjustment survey I've put in bold because in the last couple of weeks, we've had one of our junior lawyers, our very junior lawyers, who is a member of the Ability Network, conduct a fantastic survey across the firm about adjustments. People will declare certain disabilities, but sometimes there is a reticence to really say what they need. And he created this survey and the results were fascinating. It's now sitting with the board for, and HR for us to see what more, what soft intelligence is this telling us that we weren't previously aware of? And how do we ensure that we are really looking after our, our staff? So ownership of in this area and accountability starts at the top. It's just not going to succeed otherwise, whatever model you use. And they are external ex organizations that will help. I've, again, I've just listed a few on this slide. 
And so the race equality code is one that was created by Carl George, that's his brainchild, Carl George of Birmingham. And it's been adopted by many organizations, the, the NHS, many public sector bodies. We have had Carl in to, to talk about the race code and how it aligns with what we are already doing. Um, Social Mobility Foundation is one that we're working with closely. Um, working families, changing the way we live and work, really important for our parents and carers. Stonewall for our Spectrum um, team. Birmingham Race Impact Group has a lot of good events. I've certainly been to a few. 10,000 Black interns this summer for the first time. We had an intern through that um, scheme. Absolutely amazing. We only had one. It was a trial. We have already committed to taking four or five next summer. That's how pleased we were with how um, that, that program worked. And I just stuck the logo for the Halo code there because a lot of firms are adopting the Halo code. It's very easy. It just says, you know, as a Black person, this is our hair. We should be allowed to come to work with our natural hair. Who would have thought you needed a code to say that we, it's okay for us to come with our natural hair. We don't need to straighten it. We don't need to do this. You know, as it grows out of our head is an exact, acceptable way for us to come to work. Yes, we have a halo killed. So I'm gonna go back to my initial reflections on the moral or the business imperative. Let us remember that creation is intensely and intently diverse and God loves everything and everyone in it. And I want to borrow a few words for, from a publication by Whitworth University, which I think just sums up this area more eloquently than I ever could. And he says, Christians bear witness to the mystery of Christ in words and actions. We seek reconciliation across all the boundaries that divide us because Christ reconciles sinners to God and has broken down the dividing wall that separates people and communities from one another. We seek peace because Christ is our peace and calls his people to be a community of peace. We seek justice because Christ is our justice and calls his people to do justice. We seek freedom because Christ has set us free and calls everyone to live in this freedom. We seek inclusion because Christ's atoning sacrifice is for the sins of the whole world and because God's plan is to gather up all things to him. We praise God for the vast diversity of creation and for fulfilling the promise to bless all the nations by including them in Christ. Revelation 7, 9 says, I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. From every nation, tribe, people and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. On a more secular note, right here in Birmingham, Andy Street, the mayor of the West Midlands, said at the time when the West Midlands combined authority adopted the race code that the diversity of our communities is a huge strength but this is simply not reflected in boardrooms across the region. He goes on to say, evidence shows that a lack of diversity in leadership equates to organizations missing out on local talent and diverse perspectives, which could help them to be more adaptive in these challenging times. Therefore, there is a moral and economic imperative for the West Midlands Combined Authority to help the region to address this issue. 
So there is a clear business case, as I've said before. I've said, you know, there are more and more clients and suppliers challenging what we do in this space. But for those of us who believe in God's goodness for all, it is the Christian thing to do. It is the way to live our lives so that we can display the love of God in all we do. I, for those of, I suppose, a non-Christian faith or no faith, I would say it is simply the right thing to do. And I would hope that's not controversial. It is laying the foundation for a fair, just, equitable, and harmonious work environment, city, and by extension, country and world. So the moral imperative is right there with the business imperative. And I should be bold enough to claim both. I am almost finished. <laughs> it's Black History Month, as I said. And the theme for this year is it is time for change, action, not words. So as black and brown people, we're often given the double burden of experiencing racism and discrimination and then being expected to fix it. Hopefully by making the theme of this year's month, time for change, action, not words, we can all come together collectively to make a better change or to make change for the better. So I am going to throw out a few questions to those on Zoom, to those in the room, and in the hope that you can just take a few minutes to discuss further and, and let's see where we get to. So my challenge is to spend some time discerning. A lot of this as Christians, we must discern. Discern what you are being called to do together to bring about change. Think about your current environment. Is it work? Is it church? Is it a charity? Is it a board? And think about where they're at. Think about this lovely multi-ethnic and varied city. And then discern what small changes you can make. So can you be an ally? And what would that look like for you? Can you challenge recruitment practices? So you push back if you get shortlists that are not diverse. Can you help with change in culture? Can you help to foster a culture of embracing an open, honest environment where people bring their whole self to work? And what about other organizations that you can work with? I've named a few. I am sure there are others in the room who know of, know of other organizations. Can we add to this list and create a master list? On Zoom, I think you'll be discussing in breakout rooms, and then we'll come back and, and share our, our thoughts and, and see where we get to. Thank you.